Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good. Tom, how are you? Doing okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you for taking the time and joining us today. So what, uh, what's the day looking like? We're going to give it a few minutes for some people to join, but uh, what's on the docket for today? We'll be going out to the vineyards. Um, it's almost uh, 80 to 85 percent Eurasian when they turn from green to red. And uh, the uh, Sauvignon Blanc, I'm guessing, uh, is in the neighborhood of, oh, maybe three weeks out. And they're starting to pick uh, sparkling wine grapes uh, already. So um, it, harvest is in the air. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, the beginning of beginning of August. Well, I guess sparkling wine they're going to pick with a bit more, a bit more acidity there. But uh, indeed, yeah. Mum started on Monday and yesterday. Hugh up at Tromsberg, uh, they were bringing their stuff in, and uh, they're rocking and rolling up there already on the bubbly. Wow. So, uh, what's the vintage been like so far in uh, in uh, Saint Helena? How is? Are you ahead of schedule, behind schedule as compared to an average vintage? I'd have to say it's probably close to normal if there be oh. a thing anymore, but uh, uh, it's it's looking like it's right on track. Um, it, it seems to have accelerated recently, but uh, that's nothing to worry about. We're 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 certainly prepared. Uh, we have all our barrels lined up, and uh, the, the crews have been very professional this year. We've been very fortunate that uh, the. Uh, pandemic hasn't really had a, a, a major impact upon uh, upon the workforce. So uh, it, it's not business as usual, but it's it's certainly uh, we're, we're rolling forth. Uh, it's great to hear. I mean, it's, you know, it's uncertain times. So the fact that that everything's falling into place is uh, encouraging and seems like a, a bit of a sense of normalcy and a, kind of a, a crazy time, which is nice. So. Mm. Well, let me uh, introduce you guys, and then I'll quickly just show everyone on, on a map where, we're, uh, where the estate is located within California, and then I'll have you guys do just a bit of an overview of, of the estate and uh, a bit of the history. So for those just joining, um, we're delighted to have Pellet Estate. We're joined by uh, Tom Rinaldi and uh, Eric Riesch. Uh, he's the, the manager and, and director of winemaking. And we're located today, Pellet Estate is located within Napa Valley. So let me show you where we're at on the map here. This is a map of, of California. And we're in the North Coast. So in the, in the Northwest there, the little maroon red section. And if we zoom in on the North Coast, we're within Napa Valley. So within Napa Valley, do the zoom in, there's, there's a lot of sub-appellations, a lot of uh, AVAs. So we're towards the top there, and you'll see in, in uh, uh, sort of a purple section towards the top, that's St. Helena. And I think I have a map here. We can even zoom in a bit further. So here is St. Helena, and you can see there's about 45 different wineries there, I think 20 to 25 different growers. And the estate is located towards the south, uh, the south end of St. Helena. And then we can zoom in here and actually see the vineyard itself, which is pretty cool. So it's the little blue, light blue section right dead center. So just south of Spotswood, the big red area, and sort of surrounded by the, by the Beckstoffer estates, the, uh, the Dr. Crane estate, and, uh, and those legendary vineyards around it. So that's where we're located today. And I wanna hand it over to you guys to just give us a bit of history, history and where the present day estate started. So, so just give us a, a little bit of background here. Absolutely. Well, once again, I'm Eric Risch. I am the general manager for the winery. I helped reestablish uh, the winery that started to exist in 1863. Mm -hmm. It's the second oldest commercially producing vineyard in Napa Valley, uh, second only to Charles Krug. And it was created during uh, the time that Charles Krug, uh, our neighbors, Dr. Uh, Dr. Crane, Dr. George Belton Crane, H.W. Crabb from the Tokelon Vineyard down in Oakville, and uh, a, a few other uh, gentlemen around town. Uh, it, it's very historic uh, dirt there. Uh, it was originally growing sweet mission grapes, and they uh, all got together in 1875 and formed this uh, group called the uh, St. Helena Viticulture Society, uh, which is now known as Appalachian St. Helena, and which I also sit on the board of, and it's all of us members in town here, and they had sent 
Henry Pellet over back in the 1870s to Europe to bring back a bunch of different rootstocks, varietals, see what's going to grow best here uh, to really uh, mimic the Mediterranean climate uh, that was uh, been prominent in Bordeaux and the south of France and Italy and replicate that success there. So it went dormant for a while during Prohibition and then they just started growing grapes again uh, back in the, the 40s and 50s. And the current owners uh, took it over in early 2000s, and I convinced them to help reestablish the Pellet brand. Uh, it's, it's, he's one of the icons of the Valley, and we're fortunate to have Tom Rinaldi here, uh, who is another current icon of the Valley, uh, working with us. And uh, it was it was nice to be introduced to Teuton Selection to become part of them. I personally want to thank Gary Gruner for really putting together this stellar portfolio of, of, of American wines uh, here, especially in Napa Valley. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a real honor uh, to be part of the Teuton portfolio here. We offer four wines. Uh, we have two styles of Chardonnay, an unoaked version and a barrel fermented version. The unoaked is more um, indicative of like a French Grand Cru Chablis where our barrel fermented version go undergoes a secondary fermentation for 16 months and is, is uh, similar to the things that you find in Montmarchais, Pouille Montmarchais, Chazonia Montmarchais style. And then our estate reds, uh, we do two. We do our estate Cabernet, it's 100% estate. Uh, it's usually about 90% uh, Cabernet or so, a little bit of Merlot, uh, sometimes some Petit Verdot before we regraft it over the vines. And then we have our exclusive Henry's Reserve, which is never more than 100 case production. And it represents the best of the best. And Tom will kind of go through that um, uh, in just a little bit here when I turn it over to Tom here. But uh, I mean, our label design is uh, from the same era as Henry Pellet, the same time that uh, uh, Napa Valley was reintroducing wine to the world. Her name is called Electricity Presenting Light to the World. It was the only year that this appeared on the United States $5 bill. Um, it's considered the most beautiful piece of engraving ever on U.S. currency. Uh, but I had a little snag when I uh, went up for label approval and the BATF said uh, we can't have nudity on the label. And I reminded them that it was uh, indeed government issued and created uh, legal tender still is today there. So um, hmm. We have the label, even though the women in Boston back in 1896 petitioned the banks and Bureau of Printing, and, printing and, and the Bureau of Printing and Engraving at the Treasury to recall the note, and they were successful, and that's where the term "ban in Boston" started to originate. And uh, so it's, it's a very controversial image there, but it is it's it's representative of the era and uh, the high quality of uh, wines that we produce. Yeah, it's really cool. I love that. I love the image. It's it's a it's a beautiful label. It's really striking once you see it. It's one of those labels that you never forget, so uh, which is good, good for, good for a brand, of course. So, I want to hand it over to to Tom for a second. Um, what, uh, you know, for those who who don't know Tom's uh, history and background, I'll brag about you for a second. Um, I think this is your forty fifth harvest in in Napa. Is that right? Yes. So you you've got a bit of history there. It's and. For those who don't know, Tom, uh, he was one of the one of the, found, the founding winemaker of Duckhorn, and then went on to uh, found uh, Providence and Hewitt. And I know you have a lot of other small projects you've always been working on. So, tell us about you know. I heard you went into retirement. So, what made you come back out of retirement to work with Pellet? Well, I like to say I have wine in my blood, so uh, I I am. Just uh, it's it's more like a hobby now than a than a real you know profession if you will, but I I, I take it seriously. There's no two vintages the same, and um, it's very enjoyable to 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 see it unfold and and develop before your eyes. So it's something that I just can't uh, shake loose and uh, I don't know get on a cot or some sleeping bag or something you know. So uh, it's it's. I'm 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 in it for, for as long as I can, and uh, it's 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 a good ride. It, it's been it's been very 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 pleasurable, and uh, like I say, no two the same. So uh, it always offers uh, an opportunity to um, to to make something stellar. <clears throat> um, we're very blessed in the Napa Valley. We have uh, ideal climate, ideal uh, soils, and just a. Uh, an amazing variety of of um, of characteristics that uh, really we try to enhance. Uh, we like to take the credit as winemakers, but it's really the yeast that are doing all the work. They can convert the sugar into alcohol, and uh, I've been unable to do that on my own. But um, 
uh, we like to de be like shepherds, uh, just stay out of the way and allow the, uh, uh, the, the nature to take its course. Uh, we, we step into a situation when it, it starts to get a little bit, uh, I don't know, I, I, it just going off the wrong path. Um, so we, we bring them back to, back to the fold. Um, the, the vineyard for Pelotus Day is just gorgeous because it's at the base of Spring Mountain. It's got great drainage and uh, an amazing history. It's, uh, it's evolved from the mountain. And uh, they knew way back in the 1800s that this was a magical spot. And uh, it, lo and behold, uh, Cabernet and Merlot have uh, really shown to be just spectacular. They, they can stand on their own, but we, we try to see how they get along. And uh, we will be looking barrel by barrel at each and every lot, and we've already done that now recently with 18s, uh, to to see the very best of the best and um, keep them into our our eyesight and and see how they get along in 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 the blend, mm -hmm. and then eventually in the bottle. So it's um, and these wines are are meant to be consumed at at your leisure, if you will. Uh, they, they don't need to be uh, aged for a long period of time, but they will age. If you do have that kind of patience and if it's your, it's your child's birth year and you want to save for their 21st birthday or something to that effect, that's fine and dandy. They'll, they'll, they'll survive. We, we have, have found that those, uh, those wines, are, especially this style of a wine, will uh, age beautifully because they're balanced. We aim for the balance and that's what is the key to our success. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, well, we're fortunate too at, at, at Teuton. I believe our current stock of the, we have some 14 Cabernet still in stock, which is amazing. Um, so, you know, six years of bottle age, that wine is, is ready to rock. Or like you said, you could stick around for easily another five, 10 years, no problem. So uh, just tell me a bit about you know, uh, unique farming methods, wine, uh, you know, as far as harvest, what kind of processes are you guys going through uh, for the Pellet Estate vineyard? Well, it's, um, we're, we're meticulous on the balancing of the, the water with the vine and, and then uh, allowing them to get a little stressed out toward the time of harvest. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the, latter part of Eurasia now. So we have the, the crews going through by hand and pulling up leaves on the, on the morning side, exposing the fruit, and then pulling off uh, the green clusters that will never really catch up to the, the ones that are developed. And it's all done by hand and they're very meticulous on at picking time. We pick in the small uh, boxes that go into bins. Uh, there you go, there's a picture right there, uh, about 40 pounds at a time. Uh, and then going into a, um, a macro bin that you'd see uh, with the arm hanging off of it, uh, that will hold about a thousand pounds of grapes. And then when they get to the winery, here we go, uh, they'll, they'll drop into, um, into a bin and then onto a table that we can sort through. Uh, We'll be, there we are, pulling off uh, clusters that look good and uh, certainly getting rid of the ones that don't look so good. And those are the ones that have been destemmed. Very important. We don't want those stems in the neighborhood because um, they will have a, a kind of a bitter phenolic green characteristic that's uh, just not very desirable. That looks great. That's no raisins and uh, very little, if any, green uh, uh, fruit and certainly uh, ripe and ready and, and uh, we're, we're, we're going to take advantage of those for the fermentation. We'll allow them to settle for a couple of days and we'll double check the, uh, the numbers, if you will, the sugars, the acid, the, the, the levels of, uh, of the uh, nutrients. And then uh, the yeast come in and start doing their business. We'll uh, Temperature control them, allow them to get up to maybe 85, 88 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And then we'll bring them back down to about 80, allow them to finish fermenting. And then off they go to the press and they'll separate the skins from the, the wine. And uh, that wine will go into barrels and typically from, do the secondary malolactic fermentation in the barrels. Um, 
and that that's a very desirable uh, aspect to um, to the aging, if you will. It's um, it, it adds a, a roundness, a fatness, and a complexity. There's Lucy, and she's right here with us, <laughs> the winery dog. Uh, in fact, she was just about on my lap a minute ago, but <laughs> we had to make room. <laughs> But, she's, uh, I know. I, 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 I had seen when I was I was looking at some images. I didn't realize she was famous. Uh, she's been published <laughs> over here. A just released book. Yes. <laughs> Cover story too. It's a, they're volume four. They do a new issue every every two years or so from all sorts of the world parts of the world, like Australia. Uh, this is the California edition. So mm. yeah, she's a uh, she, she must be pretty proud over there. She's showing her stuff. So oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> she knows she got it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Tom, tell me just a bit about the uh, the Chardonnay Vineyard and, and where you know where that's located and, 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 and a bit about that. Well, we're very fortunate that uh, we're not trying to make uh, a Napa Valley Chardonnay. Uh, it's just too warm. It's becoming warmer by the year. It, it's okay for the sparkling wine people. They can pick it in July and August and they, they get away with it. But for us to get a, a decent characteristic we need that cool region like burgundy and we certainly have that in the petaluma gap it's uh, on the way to the ocean uh, in fact you can see the ocean from the vineyard if it isn't foggy and it's foggy quite often uh, it certainly is today um, and so it's a cool temperature um, but we're just outside of the fog belt so we do get quality sunlight and uh, a, a very decent ripening uh, this it, we have different clones for the unoaked version and the oaked version. The oaked version is a whole different animal. Uh, that'll be in the in the barrel fermenting, uh, secondary fermentation as well, and uh, will be around for months and months. Uh, whereas the Soviet, the uh, the uh, unoaked version will be in stainless steel. Um, and it'll be a, a cooler temperature during fermentation, and we're clarifying it and getting it ready for bottling by that spring. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a quick quick uh, turnaround, if you will, and uh, it's a twist off, so it's easy access, and uh, you don't have to you know snip it and make sure that the cork characteristic isn't showing off or showing down. Right. Um, so it's something. It's, I I just love the twist off. I I just have. Uh, going full speed ahead with that with that uh, characteristic of the aspect if you will yeah um, and something you don't really have to think about there's a polymer in there that mimics a cork in breathability but not in the the negative characteristics the trichloralis uh, uh, tcas uh, uh, that are potentially there we're very meticulous about our cork selections for the for the reds and for the oak version of the Chardonnay. So uh, I've yet to find one that's tainted and I'm, I'm very pleased, knock on wood. <laughs> Get Lucy all excited. It's okay, it's okay. Somebody's at the door. <laughs> that was my shoulder off a little bit here. Oh, oh well, you got away. <laughs> so, Tell me a bit about uh, about about the facility where you're uh, where you're crushing and, and aging. It looks like we're it's in uh, the Calistoga area nearby, uh, just north of Saint Helena, and um, we have a. This is the, the old days in the caves uh, at Saint Joseph, but now we're at uh, there. It's a uh, it's a building, but it's air temperature controlled, and uh, we're um, we're very fortunate to have a very good staff you now they're they're they really care about uh, our our quality concerns and uh, our cleanliness and sanitation uh, demands um, so uh, it, it's it's a very good uh, combination a good fit if you will for for our facility they have uh, wonderful equipment and uh, and we'll be we'll be doing some bottling later on this month uh, at the end of August, and uh, that's always exciting. Um, yeah, for sure. Generally speaking, the the least favorite part of winemaking because uh, everything has to be just right, and uh, there's no no wiggle room, if you will. Um, but we're we're very 
uh, very pleased and very uh, excited about this uh, upcoming bottling. Nice, and that's the 2018 vintage? Yes. And that's for the, for the whites, right? For the shards? It's for the shard and red? No, red, red red only. only. Yeah, oh, we already did the Chardonnay. Oh, okay, cool. It'll be just the, just the high-end reds. And uh, uh, they're, they're already uh, being blended now and uh, will be married, if you will, <laughs> by the time we're, we're bottling. It's, it's, it's good that you mentioned that, actually, because you remind me. Um, something that people don't think about is when, 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 you, when you're presented with a bottle is the complexity of the blending. And I know you're, you're really a master blender, and that only comes with, with experience. So can you tell me just a bit or give us a, an essence or, you know, about the complexities of blending or how you go about it or, you know, what, what's the magic? Well, I, I, for me, the, the magic is the aromatics, uh, the characteristics of the aroma, and then the flavor, how it balances, how they, they, um, how the, the, the flavors uh, marry, and and blend, and um, also the finish, how how long is that finish, and and what is it like? Um, I really don't like mean wines. I, I call it anger management. Uh, that that we, uh, we we soften those tannins. We don't use. Uh, Finding agents, uh, believe it or not, for the we, we used to in the old days. I used to use egg whites all the time, mm -hmm. and almost meticulously. But um, I think I've outgrown them, if you will. That we could we could uh, especially depend upon the barrel to add that. They're hexoses. They're they're magic sugars that don't ferment, uh, but they they have a, a softening like you put a, a sweetener to your coffee or mm -hmm. to to just sort of make them a little more appealing. And that's what really what the barrels do. They, they, they allow an oxidation, a very mild oxidation. They also do a, a, a concentration. We lose, each barrel loses one liter per month. It just oh. magically disappears. We call it the angel's share. Right. But that is water and water alcohol that is disappearing and we're adding wine back to top up that barrel every month. So it's uh, concentrating, concentrating that, that uh, flavor characteristic and uh, wine for, for um, appreciation. And I really have a feel for what my fans are going to enjoy. So it's, uh, that's very important when it comes time for blending. I, I take it very seriously, only in the morning too, it, it, by the time you've had lunch, forget about it. You want to have a beer, probably not really have to think about your, your blending. But um, we do take it very seriously. I, I certainly do. And uh, it's my favorite part of the whole wine world uh, is to see how they get along and, and to come up with the very best of the best. That's very cool. It's a moment of truth. So we're looking at the cab here. So I, I know there's, I, I think I was reading, there's two different clones. And, and then there may be a, a bit of Merlot and Petit Verdot. Um, what, do you know for the, I think right now we have, uh, well, the 14 in stock right now, but um, tell us just a bit about those components and what they add to the final blend. So the bottle right here. Oh, nice. Yes, yeah, so that's 14. The um, Petit Verdot, we realized that it's not a nece necessity. Uh, generally, it, it adds a grip. Uh, it's muscle and uh, a very little bit goes a long way. It's generally one or 2% is plenty. Um, but we've been so pleased with the Merlot that we're more and more dependent upon the Merlot. Merlot gives it the a, a, a background richness and, and a depth. Uh, it, it's just a flavor that's unique in this vineyard in particular. Um, it's so it, it's so well drained. It, that's the what almost killed Merlot in the uh, I'd say the early 2000s, late 90s is when uh, that movie Sideways came out too. There's so many yeah. of that of those grapes being planted in the wrong places, and people are just getting away by calling it Merlot. You know, once you lear learned it wasn't Merlot, uh, <laughs> exactly. then uh, you, you you just got comfortable with it. But they were going way off the, the beaten path. And I was very fortunate to be with Duckhorn from the very first uh, the vintage, 1978, 
uh, with the three palms Merlot in particular. We really, there, there he is. I found an old picture, uh, yeah. <laughs> boy, oh boy, that goes back. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that's 1978, all right. Yeah. And um, yeah, we um, were very pleased. Uh, thank God for Rick Foreman. Uh, he was a winemaker at Sterling. And he said, you've got to try this Merlot. You know, he really didn't have to do that. And uh, so it, it put us on the map right off the bat. We charged $12.50 for the Merlot wow. and only $10.50 for the Cabernet. <laughs> so that was the beginning of the, of the era. Nice. So that was uh, the bargain of the century right there. I wish I still had some of those bottles. I still have a, a, a couple rattling around and they're, nice. they're wonderful. They still to this day are are. are drinkable they're they're delicious and delightful yeah i totally believe it i love uh i love merlot and particularly the, the merlots out of duckhorn when you were there were spectacular so and that's a big portion of the henry reserve it's it's a it's a key ingredient uh, that the merlot is as a is a always a big player in that final hundred case blend that we put together and uh that's that's four barrels for the best of the best so that's that's a good point. So the, the selection of this, it's not a specific plot within the vineyard. It's you just look at the barrels and then make a selection. That's right. Exactly right. And uh, there, you know, there's different uh, press levels and, and different uh, toast levels. That's very important. Thank you, Eric. Because uh, the the toasting of the of the barrels is what really uh, has a huge amount of flavor component. Typically, these are French oak barrels and uh, aged 36 to 48 months uh, and then assembled professionally and toasted to, uh, to a point where they'll bring out those sweet hexo sugars, um, but not to a point where you're going to get any kind of smoke, any kind of uh, burnt characteristic. Uh, we call it blonde heavy toast, uh, so it looks like it's just like the outside looks like the inside. Hmm. Um, but uh, there is a, a characteristic that, that we will get from that, the fire inside the, the, inside the barrel while it's being uh, assembled and, and uh, turned into a barrel. Um, the, typically what they'll have is a steel, stainless steel cage around the, around the wood itself. So it's not in contact with the fire and then I, I put, I fired a barrel, uh, it's kind of fun. And the, you're looking up at a computer that's telling you it's getting a little too warm here, you know, so you slap it around with some water and, and now it's not warm enough, you know, so you throw in a few more little pieces of, of oak into the fire. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of exciting. And, and, you know, for, it turns out that I got uh, the barrel said a hundred percent toasting accuracy. So that was, huh. Uh, source of pride, if you will. Yeah, it's very cool. I've I, I was I was fortunate enough once when I was in Bordeaux to visit a cooperage. So, for for people listening, if you ever have an opportunity to visit a cooperage, it's fascinating. It's it's a whole other world. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's we crazy. have them out here in Napa Valley too. So if you get out to the Napa Valley, you can arrange to to get a, a tour of the cooperage. Oh, they're okay. they're very exciting. I, I love going there. And, uh, they don't ever mind seeing me and. Uh, They've been meticulous about that. You cannot tell um, a French oak barrel that's assembled in France as opposed to assembled in uh, Napa Valley. So that's that's a very crucial aspect to um, to our um, our selections, if you will, uh, that we proved that years and years ago that uh, it didn't matter that if they came over here as staves or if they came over here as barrels, uh, we we could. Uh, we could make it make it work. Oh, huh, that's really cool. I never, I didn't know that there was such a big industry of of, of uh, cooperage in, in Napa. It's very cool. It is very cool. We have one in Calistoga, one in Napa, hmm. a couple in Sonoma. They're 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 peppered around, and uh, they're they're really they're 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 very cool. Hmm. So we're about at our at our mark here. But before we head out, for those who aren't listening in the first few seconds, there. Give us a preview of the 2020 harvest, how it's looking, Chardonnay versus Cab. Are you in the sweet spot or early, late? How's it looking? We're, we're gearing up. It'll be a, a September phenomenon for us this year. Hmm. We may even stretch into uh, 
early October, but September is going to be very exciting. Uh, for the Chardonnay, it'll be uh, probably mid-September. I'm, I'm, I haven't really been uh, on top of it right, right away, but uh, I'm not worried. Uh, it's something that we'll be uh, putting in our, our eyesight uh, very shortly. And uh, it's been a good ride because we can make a, make a decision on picking pretty far in advance. It's, it's, it's nice uh, to, to have that feeling because then we can get on the board with the, with the, with the pickers and make sure that uh, the winery is ready, that the equipment, everything is, is going to be uh, set to our sites. Quite often when we're out there at night, and I mean uh, pretty close to before sunrise, and they got the little lights on their head, and uh, those grapes are ready to to rock and roll by eight o'clock in the morning at the winery. So that's the everything stays nice and cool. We do have cool to cold nights uh, here in Napa Valley, especially during the harvest time, and uh, that that makes all the difference in the world. We don't have to worry about them turning into raisins. Right. Well, no, you guys are truly blessed up there and, and, and producing spectacular wine. It's, uh, I can, just on behalf of Teuton, it's, uh, it's amazing to work with Pellet Estates. Thank you so much. Um, Eric as well. Both of you guys have been uh, great partners and um, keep up the great work. Great. No, look forward to uh, continuing our great relationship with Teuton. I can't wait for uh, this pandemic to be over so I can start to work the market again with uh, the good folks over there on the East Coast, Aaron and James and yeah. Eric Rees down in Florida. And yeah. I can't thank Gary Gruner enough for putting together such an excellent team to work with. Uh, it's, it's really a joy. Yeah, they're, uh, they're all good guys. And we, we look forward to, to seeing you and, uh, and working the market again for, for sure. So uh, I'll give one more shout out to, uh, to Lucy there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that jackrabbit patrol there, keeping the varmints away. She's a lucky dog, that one. All right. Well, um, goodbye from Napa Valley, and thank you, everyone, for watching, and uh, keep up the great work, guys. Thank you again. Uh, have a great day. Okay. Thanks, David. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye, guys. Bye.